your household. <laughs> it was That's insane. Chaotic. Someone actually asked me in the field when they saw me with the four cavapoos and the running buggy. Um, they said, oh, excuse me, do you look after dogs for a living? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> you have hundreds of different bioactive plant chemicals. Well, CBN, which is a breakdown product of THC, it's less intoxicating for people, but it can help with um, calming and it can help with pain. What are the things that we should really be asking about and yeah. looking for in a good quality CBD product? There's less choice than there used to be, but you still, there's still a few companies that have passed that are what's called full spectrum CBD. Even in Holland and Barrett, there was a recent um, report that came out that someone just sh in the industry just shared with me that there's still some things on the shelf that have no CBD in them. And then we have some patients who have, we've even combined cannabinoids, you know, with, with other treatments like ketamine assisted psychotherapy. It's real hope for the, for people, my patients with these conditions that have been, they've been told they've basically given up. Cannabis has given them their life back. Today, I'm doing a podcast with Dr. Danny Gordon, who is an expert in everything to do with cannabis medicine. She's actually been responsible for training UK qualified practitioners who utilize cannabis medicines. And we're going to talk about CBD and the other chemical constituents that make up the entourage effect. She's also written a book called the CBD Bible that you'll find in the link below. And we also talk about the combination of nootropics like caffeine and CBD, whether it's a good thing, whether it's a bad thing. And there's also an introduction from Dr. Michael Dixon, who is chair of the College of Medicine, a hugely decorated general practitioner in the UK has been responsible for really pioneering the complementary movement. We also talk about the need to take safe risks within medicine and actually embracing alternative models of care beyond just pharmaceutical to look at the more holistic as well. We definitely need to do another podcast with Dr. Michael because he is just a breath of fresh air and he's been in the game for so long as well. So I really hope you enjoy these two episodes as an introduction with Dr. Michael Dixon and then the main podcast with Dr. Danny Gordon. Doctor's Kitchen, recipes, health, lifestyle. Michael, congratulations, first of all. This is a wonderful, wonderful event. I can really feel the energy. I'm sure you can too. Oh, amazing energy here, yes. Um, I have to say it was a big risk, you know, back in January, the thought of having a conference where 800 people would come on three days face to face was yeah. uh, probably madness. Um, but it's it's happened and uh, everyone's come. Yeah. And it's wonderful to be able to meet face to face again and start talking about integrated health. Yeah, I think that's, again, something that's a catalyst for the energy that I'm feeling here. Everyone I've spoken to on the podcast here and just whilst walking around, have been so galvanized by the conversations that are happening outside the speaking events as well and the workshops too. Do you, do you feel like from the last time you've put on a conference, which is probably two, two, three two years, years ago? ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How far have we, have we gone forward? Because to me, at least, it feels like we've come leaps and bounds. I think we've moved forward immensely because... One of the things I've noticed about this conference, Rupi, is we've got an awful lot of clinicians, an awful lot of doctors, an awful lot of GPs. Um, and that didn't happen in the past. We had a lot of therapists, we had a lot of interested people. But I think we're gaining momentum, not only in numbers, but also in enthusiasm. Uh, and I think it's all brought about a bit by COVID, a bit by a feeling that, you know, long-term disease is just increasing and, you know, a lot of people here, uh, having to face patients day by day and just not having the weaponry with which to actually help them. And they're, they're coming here not only, I think, for a bit of a buzz, but also actually to find out some detailed stuff and what they really can do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. You, you've, you've been at this for a number of years. You're really early to the game. T talk to me about your sort of step change in the way you are thinking about medicine and how you've incorporated a lot of the things that we're talking about today on stage. Well, it's a long story, Rupi, but um, I was... We've got about, time, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I was about 10 years into medicine, and I remember going into surgery one day. It was raining, and I dreaded it um, because I thought, I can't stand going into surgery and spending another day seeing people with depression, stress, bad backs, you know, overweight, uh, chronic tiredness, frequent infections, and just not having, you know the treatment that would actually help them, um, uh, let alone not even helping them to not get there in the first place. Uh, I, I was intensely depressed and, and, and 
uh, oddly enough, uh, a few weeks later, the wife of a judge rang me up. Uh, she was a Christian healer and said, I want to come and work in your surgery, Dr. Dixon. And I thought that was the most outrageous uh, offer I'd ever been offered <laughs> in my life. Um, but I thought, well, this is interesting. You know, I've got nothing to lose because I'm pretty fed up at the moment anyway. Uh, lovely partners who thought it was very strange, but they went ahead with it. She worked in our practice for a while. And I was just amazed by what a person can do without all the gimmicks of medicines, injections and everything else. She really made an awful lot of people better. Um, in fact, we uh, wrote her up a few years later because we did a, a controlled trial. Um, and uh, Stephen Fox, who was then editor of the journal, the Royal Society of Medicine, had been the, the Lancet. Um, he'd even did a leader on the paper we wrote. And he said, Dixon's shown that healing helps his patients. What he hasn't shown is that it's not not a placebo. <laughs> and, right, and of okay. course, you know, well, you know, what's that mean <laughs> yeah. saying healing's not a placebo? Because it was just one person yeah. to one person. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I wasn't bothered as long as the patients got better. That opened my eyes because I suddenly realized that it wasn't just about the medicines I gave. And then I got more interest in complementary medicine, all the different modalities which I use today from acupressure to herbs, uh, then social prescribing. And then the whole thing's opened up, hasn't it? We're suddenly beginning to realize that so many other things are important for our health and well-being, both in healing and in stopping getting ill in the first place, beyond you know the limitations of the drugs in our surgery. For me, uh, not only was it uh, an awakening, but it was also a resuscitation uh, because um, I suddenly started enjoying my life again. I could do something with some, some with back pain. I could give them a manipulation. I, I could try a bit of acupuncture, you know. And if people came and wanted to talk about homeopathy, well, at least I knew what they were talking about. It wasn't, you know, hostile like so many of my colleagues. Um, so, so, so it's regenerated my life and here I am you know in my 70s uh, still really enjoying general practice I'm probably the most ancient GP in Devon but I, <laughs> but I love it you know because um, if you've got something you can offer people uh, and if you uh, are, are lucky enough to have come uh, to, together with this sort of personalized approach where you're really digging deeply into people's lives knowing how they are and after 40 years I know them quite well in their families you know it's the greatest job on earth yeah. um, it's so so that's my message of this conference is you know let we want to liberate our clinicians to do what they really set out to do in the first place, which is to help their patients, to make them help, not to fill in forms, not to get payment for their quaff results, not to worry about the next CQC visit, but to do the right thing. Yeah. And you mentioned there a couple of things. We want to liberate our patients. I think also we almost want to liberate ourselves from the limiting beliefs that we have to do sing things a certain way. And one of the things you said earlier was it doesn't really matter what I did or what I prescribed as long as the patients got better. And I think that's the core thing that a lot of people, and I think my, from my own experience, I wasn't really taught that way. Do, do you think there's something changing in the way we're bringing up our, our new medical yes. uh, clinician? Do you yes. think there's a difference in the, the way it, we're teaching them? I think it is. I think it's sort of back to the future, though, you know, because, you know, when I set out, there wasn't NICE, there wasn't CQC, there wasn't anything. You know, you, you watched what your predecessor did, and my predecessor gave lots of Latin naming drugs and everything else, and you carried on. You know, that's how it was. And it wasn't as safe and good, and, you know, people died in their 60s of heart disease, whereas they're now living to the 80s, et cetera. Then we had evidence-based medicine, population-based medicine, which was great to begin with because, uh, you know, there were some standards and some guidelines. However, it's become a terrible tyrant. Um, uh, and what it means now is I see you and all I do is impose my population-based evidence on you. I don't see rupee. I don't see you in, in all your greatness, you know, the, the way you live your life, your relationships, what you eat, what you drink, what you do, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I just literally just look up the guidelines and it says your, uh, you know, your cholesterol levels above X, therefore I give you a statin and a drug for this and a drug for that. And that's not what medicine's about. Medicine's about you, First of all, what you can do for yourself, because half the time you're making yourself healthy and treating yourself, you know, by your own in internal uh, ph pharmacopoeia. Um, uh, but it's uh, so, so it's some, partly for me about encouraging 
what would naturally happen anyway, sometimes using my medicine, but using it, you know, uh, not in this very didactic way. And also, you know, sometimes taking a few risks, Sa risks in terms of whether things will work or not, not safety risks, but sometimes trying things that you think might be helpful, perhaps complementary treatment, um, uh, and, 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 and going with it, you know, because we know that if you think it's going to work, it's more likely to work. Um, and we need to get a proportionality about what evidence is required in what situation. And if it's likely to be a self-limiting illness, uh, and if it's something that you know, the patient knows all about, why not sort of go beyond these bounds? And, and unfortunately, we have a younger generation who are terrified of litigation, yes. terrified of their peers saying that they're quacks, etc. cetera. Um, and we need to overcome this fear. Yeah, yeah, I, I mm. think you mentioned risks there. And I certainly see that there is a fear of going against the norm. And obviously there are boundaries for a reason. There have been some pretty uh, well-known cases of, of doctors working outside of what is actually safe, mm -hmm. knowingly as well. But I think within the bounds of reason, uh, if you're going to instigate a an intervention that is safe and you know potentially can have benefit, we have to encourage our clinicians to to, to take those uh, and, and to, to promote those. You must have come under a lot of fire over the last couple of decades, <laughs> right? In terms of taking risks. <laughs> How do you deal with the critics? Because that, that's one of the main things I get from people not really wanting to talk about these things with patients or even amongst their colleagues. Mm. Yeah, how, do, how have you dealt with that? Well, really, the patients, because they've, you know, they've, they've got better and they want to come and see me and uh, tell tales of how things have changed in their lives. So, and that's what really matters as a doctor. Uh, I have to say my peers, yes, I listen to my peers, but they matter less to me than what the patients are saying. And as you well know, in general practice, we now have to have scores for what our peers think of us, yeah, yeah, yeah. scores for what our patients think of us. And I have to say in the early days of those scores, my peer scores weren't terribly high because <laughs> people thought, well, you know, Dixon sort of goes somewhat, you know, over the rails but actually bit by bit they're te they're getting interested in this because you know what we're talking about integrated health and care it's medicine in color it's medicine in in reality and it's human form and it's passion and, and that's what you're seeing here at this conference not this very gray idea of it all being a spreadsheet with various flow diagrams and care pathways we talk about don't we i, I think of them almost like sort of the rat runs you know poor old patient has to be pushed down a care pathway not allowed to decide for himself not allowed to have a discussion with the, the clinician in the first place. Um, and uh, yes, I've, I've had numerous attacks in the past, but you know, um, I think if, if nobody attacks you, you don't matter. Um, and, uh, and you know, provided 51% are on my side, I don't mind about the other 49%. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned you're in your 70s and you, you 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 I can feel the passion the energy and the vigor that you still have for the profession a lot of people are leaving um and there are lots of vacancies within an NHS how do we inspire the new generation to see medicine in color just like you were just like you mentioned well first of all we take away the shackles um I was talking to Claire Girardi yesterday um uh, and she said on the platform why don't we get rid of all statutory training um, uh, uh, and that's something I've been saying for years. So let's give it that for a start, because then old doctors like me who want to come back into the profession will do without doing all this rubbish about fire drills and all the rest of it, especially I, I, I'm in a one story building with an open window. I don't need to spend an hour on fire drill. Um, probably better if I learned a bit more about biomedicine. But anyway, so first of all, take away the shackles, um, uh, CQC, confine them to looking after the rotten apples, because we all know what the rotten apples are. They don't need to be you know, going around seeing everybody else. So take away some of that bureaucracy, that bit that makes our younger generation afraid. Um, and then um, start enthusing, I think, in their real role as GPs, which is not only about seeing the individual patient and doing the best for them, but it's about empowering the local patients and the population in the community to be healthier generally. And, and that's, we should be the barefoot public health physicians of the future with funding streams to support that role so that 
Uh, part of my role, yes, is face to face. We do three or four days a week, but we can't. You know, very few doctors are full time. Yeah. Nine, ten sessions now. So those other sessions, going to the school, going to the even the supermarket, the planning team for the local authority, bringing primary care, the voluntary sector, and the local authority together. That for me would release general practice to be magnificently effective, not only in individual patient care, but also in population health. And I think that would make our younger GPs uh, much more interested in their job. Um, at the same time, we do need reinforcements. I mean, we've had three secretaries of state saying there are going to be more GPs. One said 4,000, one said 5,000. I think the latest is 6,000. Each time they say it, it goes down. Yeah, it yeah. has done for the last <laughs> yeah, 10 yeah. years. So there is a limit to what you can do in 10 minutes, really. Yeah. You know, we need quarter of an hour appointments. We need time to really sort people out because it's cost effective if you do. And we also need to bring back that ability, which I had 40 years ago, which I, I don't see now as easy with the younger doctors, to have an ongoing relationship, continuity of care, because that's what patients over 65 who are very ill or have long-term disease want. Um, and it's those relationships that make you go into work. You know, it's almost like seeing the next installment of that patient's life. So I think it's about continuity. It's about creating a public health role, but it's also about uh, taking away the bureaucracy and giving people a bit more headroom because the, day, the day's work at the moment is undoable. And most GPs are fed up because they want to do a good job and they feel they can't, and they don't like doing a half-baked job. Mm. You're such an inspiration. Thank you so much for your just the continued work you're doing because you're, you're really inspiring everyone from those who are ingrained in their profession to those coming through the ranks as well. So I really, really do appreciate it. Well, Rupert, can I return the compliment? You know, I think you're pushing the borders yourself. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I really look forward to working with you to uh, see what we can do, especially in these eat well sites, which I hope will come online, uh, where we take a whole community and literally shake it and, and, and enable it to um, not only access healthy food through vouchers, whatever, for people that can't afford it, but also create a culture, a completely different feel to how we might live. Um, I'm, I'm learning so much at this conference in specific ways. We've just heard a wonderful lecture on, I didn't know this, on how high uric acid levels are another biomedical marker for inflammation and metabolic disease. Uh, and I'm sure that you, you know you, you know all about this, but I, I thought uric acid was just something you treat with, um, uh, you know, with stuff out of Purinol when you've got kidney stones or when you've got, um, uh, uh, you know, gout. Yeah. Um, turns out it's quite different. Yeah. You know, I'm tomorrow I'm going to have to be practicing totally differently. But, yeah. But I've, yeah. Learned, I've learned things here. I didn't know. Well, you know, outside there, most GPs don't know this. Yes. This is why they need to be coming here for future conferences, because this is the place, you know, the, the light bulb moments, which uh, they can't get in the traditional textbooks and literature. Yeah. Can I give you some advice? I would book a much bigger venue next time, because I think <laughs> after this goes out, people are going to get proper FOMO and they're going to want to come. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can fill more seats because well, I agree. A lot more people need to know about the stuff that we've been mm. talking here over the last couple of days. Yeah. And can I can carry on the interview with you, really? I yeah, mean, cool. <laughs> how, how do we get this into the outside world? How do we, uh, you know, it's all right. We're all slightly, the, you know, the, the, the people had already been persuaded of this. Yeah. But there are plenty out there yeah. who are fed up. They've got the crash helmets on. Yeah. And, you know, come five, six or seven o'clock and eat. The last thing they want to do is to come to a conference like yeah. this. Yeah. How do we start interesting them? It's interesting. So I'm going to be talking about this a bit later uh, at, at the event this evening. Um, but I think it comes down to three core areas, uh, content, culture, and community. So content, things like this that we're doing today, putting out information, whether it be via the medium of a podcast, a video, or, or you know, educational events. I think that's that's key. And that has to be integrated in the uh, the mainstream sort of conventional way of, treat, of, of teaching our nurses and doctors and our health professionals i think that the the culture aspect is a culture of wanting to learn postgraduate but also being open-minded to all the other elements that we would otherwise you know sort of veer against for fear of litigation i think again this the, the comments you made about the cqc 
impact our culture negatively because we were always worried about what other people might think of us, but also the ramifications of doing something outside the guidelines. And community, I think, is something that we haven't really tapped into as much. I was chatting to Lord Nigel Crisp, who, who is a, a good a colleague and friend of yours, about what we can learn from developing nations mm -hmm. and how you can actually create a salutogenic environment by doing things like putting outdoor gyms or having um, people who are health advocates in the community and spreading out those health messages, mm -hmm. having cooking kitchens, teaching mm -hmm. kitchens, instilling a uh, an air of of the norm being an eating a salad instead of the norm being grabbing a sandwich or having 15 to 20 minutes at work to, to rush your lunch yeah. in front of your desk. You know, yeah. these norms have to be changed and that, that has to start at a community level. So I think if we can engage in those three things, and I'm sure there are other things as well, it's a good start. And mm -hmm. I think that's how we'll get some change. Great. Well, it'll be your generation that will need to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Thank that you was Ruby. Wonderful. That's great. Really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. you're talking about dancing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I need to get back into it, but uh -huh. it's it's just a bit far for me to travel. So yeah. now that I'm not doing that, I have to start doing Pilates or something. Yes. To yeah. keep the core strong. Yeah. Because yeah. I lifted the running buggy over a stile in the field with the two cavapoos. Oh. And this is when this happened. Wow. Yeah, yeah a lot's changed since we last chatted. Yeah. So not only have you had a baby, but <laughs> you've got not one dog, but a dog with uh, a litter. Is that yeah. what you call it? Yeah. Is that litter? Yeah, yeah. She had a litter. litter of pups. Yeah, and then, had a litter. And now you have two two dogs. Yeah. <laughs> the, mad, the, the cavapoo pack. And actually, because I'm totally insane, this last yeah. week... Um, this last week, we agreed to look after one of Indy's puppies okay. when they went away. Uh -huh. And so, of course, my husband said, oh, sure, we'll look after her. That's fine. <laughs> but she also has an older dog. So we ended up having four dogs. Oh, my word. Um, three Cavapoos and a very um, old, slightly unhealthy, but very <laughs> sweet Shih Tzu with a kidney disorder. <laughs> Your household. <laughs> it was <laughs> insane. Chaotic. Someone actually asked me in the field when they saw me with the four cavapoos and the running buggy. Um, they said, oh, excuse me, do you look after dogs for a living? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair point. It's a fair it's observation. A fair point. It's yeah, a fair yeah. point. So you know, no, that's been my um, life update. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of more because we want, I want to talk about... The, the next book, your, your resilience medicine dot clinic, uh, a whole bunch of things. Um, but what, why don't we start off with cannabinoids? We've already done a, a really uh, engaging podcast episode on CBD and, and the wider sort of uh, molecules from yes. from the, the plant um, that people can listen back to. But I think as a refresher, it's always nice to sort of reintroduce the guest, what your shtick is, what you love talking about. And it's about cannabinoids. So let, let, let's yes. let's talk about CBD and what that means and, and where it comes from. Yeah, so cannabinoids are a group of plant chemicals from the cannabis plant. And the most well-known one is CBD. So CBD is found in supplements uh, from hemp, which you can buy at Holman & Barrett and places like that. And it's also in medical products that I prescribe for my patients. The medical side of it is medical cannabis. And those are products that are on prescription. And it's not widely used here yet, but I prescribe them in my clinic. Many others are starting to. And those products usually have a little bit more THC, which everyone thinks of the compound making them feel high. Mm -hmm. But actually, THC in small amounts is very safe and effective and well tolerated for most of my medical patients. And it helps with things like chronic pain, um, mental health, sleep, um, especially combined with a lot of CBD. Mm -hmm. So the cannabinoid medicine is one of my great tools that I use in the wider thing that I do, which is integrative medicine yeah. and uh, resilience. Yeah. And so cannabis as a plant, like you said, CBD is the most well-known one. There are a bunch of other derivatives as well. Uh, yes. Talk us through sort of the wider picture. I'm not expecting you to go through every single one because there are many, <laughs> but but what other ones may people have heard of as yeah. well? Yeah. So um, what I always tell people is cannabis, cannabinoid medicines, cannabis medicines, they're a group of medicines. It's a whole um, category of medicines, not a single medicine. So within uh, one plant extract, I use what's called whole plant extracts with my patients. Um, you have hundreds of different bioactive plant chemicals. There's over a hundred cannabinoids. So in addition to CBD and THC, we have CBDA, we have THCV, we have CBN, and the list just goes on and on, CBG. Now, most of the clinical work has been done with CBD, 
and THC, but there's emerging evidence for some of these other ones too. Um, so that's why we like to use the whole plant medicine because you get all of these things in, in a single extract yeah. in varying combinations, depending on what product you use mm -hmm. and depending on what you're treating. So for example, CBN, which is a breakdown product of THC, it's less intoxicating for people, but it can help with um, calming and it can help with pain. So sometimes patients like that feeling and you can get that by actually um, putting your medical cannabis into a vaporizer, um, using it a few times, and the THC actually turns into CBN when you use it a few times. Okay. So I discovered this years ago clinically because I had patients who were saying, you know, it's funny, Dr. Gordon, I, I like to use my cannabis a second and third time sometimes because I find it makes my, my pain, it makes me calmer and my pain better, but it doesn't give me that, that intoxication feeling. Okay. This is years ago before we had any research on CBN, mm -hmm. but it was probably because there's more CBN in that old cannabis. Right, right. So as you can see, we're only just at the yeah. beginning of understanding this plant, but this is how we currently use it. Yeah, and you, you described in your, your first book, uh, the CBD Bible, was it called the CBD Bible? Yep. Yep. Um, because I thought it might have been called the Cannabis Bible. No, the it CBD should have Bible. been called that, but yeah. it was too controversial. So we, ah. it is about medical cannabis and CBD. Okay. But Because it makes sense because you talk about everything. Yeah, we talk just, about everything. Yeah. And that's, that's yeah. the problem with the title. But at the time, it was it was that it was even controversial for a major <laughs> publishing house yeah. to publish that. So we had to go with the CBD Bible. Yeah, yeah. And now I see CBD like on buses, yeah. like, you know, being fed to me on my, my Instagram feed and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So it just seems that, you know, to be everywhere. So your, your, your book was definitely timely. Um, you talked about in your book, uh, The Entourage Effect yes. of all these different uh, compounds. Tell, tell us a bit about what the entourage effect means and why yeah. you know, you using something that's a bit more upstream can have those, those downstream effects. Yeah, so the entourage effect, we see this a lot in botanical medicine mm. where you put different herbs or herbs together um, to get the desired effect. And when you use just a single thing by itself, it doesn't have as good of an effect as when you combine uh, some different herbals together. Um, however, cannabis brings that to a whole new level because you get the entourage effect within the same plant mm -hmm. because the CBD and the THC and the CBDV and the THCV and the terpenes, they all work together um, on different bioactive, well, biochemical pathways in the brain and the body, and they support the action of the other. Now, a lot of those synergistic or combined actions we're still learning about, mm -hmm. but we do know that when you give patients a full plant extract, they get better with lower doses, okay. less side effects. And this has been well researched and published now, even in, in very severe cases like children with epilepsy, children with autism. If you give them pure CBD, it helps a significant proportion of those kids, but they get side effects because you have to get to very high levels of purified CBD. But if you give them a whole plant extract that is still high in CBD, but the tiny bit of the trace THC, tiny bit of the trace other things, mm -hmm. Um, they, they get better at smaller doses and there's virtually no side effects. So it's the same with my patients with chronic pain or um, mental health conditions that you want with any medication, as we know, we want to use the lowest effective dose. Yeah. And the entourage effect allows us to do that and to personalize the medicine to the person. Yeah, I guess it's similar in the way we like to talk about food on this podcast. Yes. You know, instead of taking a quercetin tablet in isolation, which might be you know beneficial in certain circumstances, you might as well, you'd be better served by going for the whole apple or the whole onion or, you know, the, the parsley, which also has the collection of the other uh, elements that make it so healthy, the apigenin, the fiber, the luteolin, all these different plant chemicals that we have at our disposal. And so if you just purify it, you're getting, yes, some benefit, but actually there is a benefit in terms of the, the rich, complex tapestry of the other ingredients. Correct. And, you know, just like with food as medicine, I think we have to tell people that's well, like you do. Mm. So I tell them when to listen to your podcast because <laughs> it, it's the base of therapy. The base of therapy, you know, supplements are the icing on the cake. Mm. The base of therapy needs to be the food. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you need that nature is quite smart, anyways, like mm. you said. So if, you know, if you want to use a specific um, bioactive compound or nutraceutical on top of the food to get that extra effect, you might want to do that. But yeah. if you don't start with the base, right, of real food, mm. then you're not going to get the same effect. Yeah. Yeah. And, Within your book, you talked about the application of different um, well, varieties of, of CBD for, for different uh, uh, medical uh, specialties and, and, and conditions. You talked about Alzheimer's, you talked about um, uh, 
well, actually, we're going to talk about mental health today. I want to dive into that a bit more because I can't remember whether we talked about mental health and CBD, but I definitely want to talk about mental health today. So in what context would you be thinking about CBD as a supplement uh, and for which category of mental health disorders? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two categories. Mm -hmm. There's self-care, which we know is in the supplement realm. So that's someone who might be suffering from mild stress, um, related symptoms that are not reaching clinical criteria. Okay. So these are people who, they don't have clinical anxiety disorder. It's not, the symptoms are not at the point where they're impacting their life in a negative way that they need to go and see the doctor or see a specialist, like a psychiatrist. Um, but they're feeling stressed. They're feeling a little bit burned out. So they might want to go and try something like CBD as a supplement. So trying CBD as a supplement, it's not, you know, CBD is CBD. CBD as a supplement is the same molecule that I'm prescribing, but the amount of THC in the product will be different. The dosage will be different. So for stress-related mild symptoms, um, lower dose CBD that you get on the shelves from a good full spectrum, what's called full spectrum hemp product, where you're getting that full entourage effect on a lower level, even though there's not much THC, um, can be effective for people. So it can be similar to taking L-theanine and doing a relax relaxation practice. So um, it's not going to be a cure-all, but it can be a really helpful tool. Yeah. And oftentimes they will um, use that alongside food as medicine, alongside things like mindfulness and meditation. And then I have the people who have already tried that hasn't really helped or it's helped a little bit, but they want something stronger or they want to know more. And that's where medical cannabis can be very helpful. Okay. So people who have treatment resistant anxiety, or they've tried a few antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, and they've had lots of side effects. Um, I have a lot of patients like that. Or they just didn't work. We know that at least a third of people with major depressive disorder do not respond to conventional antidepressants. So it's those people that we're looking for an alternative that is low side effect profile, that is going to be hopefully effective for them and well tolerated. And that's where medical cannabis can be very helpful and very effective. Um, so in that sense, we're still using those high CBD whole plant extracts, but it has a little bit more THC. Okay. How much are we Depends on the person, but usually for medical cannabis, we'd start someone out with what's called a 20 to one CBD ratio to one part THC. THC. So 20 parts CBD, one part THC ratio. And you might start with a dose of say, um, 10 milligrams of the CBD dose to the CBD three times a day and then you work your way up to effect. So as we know in medicine, some drugs have uh, a very straightforward dosage and then other medications, you basically start low and go slow and you titrate to effect. That's what we do with cannabinoids. Um, and when you do this way, it's actually very safe. It's effective for most people. Sometimes you have to switch products. Sometimes you don't always get it right the first time because these are full plant medicines. So the strain can have an effect, the, what's called the chemovar, the dose, the ratio of the CBD and the THC. Um, there's other instances where people come to see me and they're already self-medicating with black market cannabis because it's all they can find. And they think that it helps with their anxiety, but then they notice that their anxiety kind of rebounds. And that's because too much THC, it's a double-edged sword for anxiety because of what's happened at the brain receptor. And um, too much THC can actually cause anxiety. Mm. So sometimes it's finding the right, it's really finding the right um, product and the right dose for that patient. Yeah, yeah. Because it sounds a bit counterintuitive because yeah. I've certainly come across some patients who have been regular users of black market cannabis and they present with anxiety, they present with these symptoms that we're actually trying to get rid of. And so the idea that you can uh, treat them with a, a full spectrum CBD, which includes THC, which is you know yeah. likely responsible for, the, for those uh, symptoms, seems counterintuitive. It's totally counterintuitive. And you know this is what's so complicated about the endocannabinoid system. But also, you know, as we know in medicine, there's causative relationships and there's correlational relationships. So there's been a lot of work done to try to tease this apart um, in the area of mental health and cannabis, specifically cannabis and psychosis. Okay. So um, one of the leaders in this area is Dr. Uh, Professor Carl Hart from Columbia, who I actually spoke at a conference with yesterday. Oh, really? So he <laughs> yeah. is one to follow if you're interested in this topic. Yeah, yeah, great. Cool. And his, 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 his whole um, specialty area is cannabis and psychosis. And he has taught us that, you know, cannabis and psychosis, there's a link, but it's not a causative link. Okay. So people who develop chronic psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, 
they are more likely to report using cannabis, but it's not necessarily the cause being cannabis and then the effect being schizophrenia. In fact, it hasn't been proven at all. And he's, he's, he's published a few papers recently on this. So, but it's a really big misperception in medicine. This is one of the, the biggest questions I get asked by my colleagues. You know, aren't you just afraid they're gonna have a psychotic episode? Um, well, the answer is no, if it's medical cannabis. But that being said, of course, if someone had a family history, like a brother, a sister, or a mother, or father with, with schizophrenia, um, I wouldn't be prescribing them high THC products. I would be using only CBD. CBD is mood stabilizing and it has antipsychotic properties. There's been a few studies comparing it, short studies, just yeah. six weeks, comparing it to a leading antipsychotic drug, yeah. and they've performed equally. Wow. So even within the same plant, different cannabinoids can have opposite effects and have the same cannabinoid, THC, have opposite effects at different doses. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, uh, you can understand the sort of dosing effect because there's a, sort of like a, what do we call it in, um, in medicine, a, a narrow therapeutic window and yeah. outside of that window, it can be toxic. You know, lithium's a, a typical exactly, example. Exactly, that's a good one. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, and cannabis has a very wide therapeutic index for mm. most things. Um, but of course there are areas in mental health where you have to be more careful. Mm. So I've treated thousands of patients with medical cannabis and I specialize really in mental health, mental well-being, neuropsychiatric conditions. Uh, most of my patients have a whole list of diagnoses when they come to see me, but at least one of them is usually anxiety, anxiety and depression together, insomnia. Um, so they're very common conditions and cannabinoids usually are very effective at helping to treat them. They're not a cure. So you, patients still have to do the work. You know, we do an integrative approach with them. We, you know, it helps them engage with therapy more. It helps them do things like exercise, which we know is so good for depression. Um, but then you have people who don't fit that mold. I have patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or chronic regional pain syndrome in depression. So they can't exercise their way out of their depression. So yeah. then what do we do for those people? So these are some of the, the areas where cannabis can be very helpful. Absolutely, yeah. I, I'm a firm believer in that, you know, all these are different tools and sometimes yeah. you need to fit the right tools in the right place before you actually get some uh, directional movement in the way you want to go. But uh, taking it a step back, back to the self-care sort of uh, aspect of, yeah. of CBD, that's, you know, the stuff that most people listening to this might might be thinking about trying if they do have these issues of anxiety. And, you know, we always talk about the foundational support methods of, of diet and sleep, lifestyle, you know, self-work, all those different things. But let's say they've, they've dabbled with those, they've had some success, but they want to try because they know CBD and, and you know, things that they've read about in your book, perhaps, or listened to on the podcast. Um, they want to dabble. What, what sort of uh, directions or what kind of guidance would you give those kind of people who are just trying to dip their toe? Well, I think, you know, if it's just for mild stress related conditions, I mean, CBD is so safe for most people, even if you're even if people are on medications, of course, you know, it's not this is not medical advice, but um, most medications, there's no severe drug herb interactions with a very few exceptions. If you're on anti seizure medicines, there's one of those called Clobazam that's bad. But other than that, um, using a low dose of CBD, like start with five milligrams a few times a day, take it with food because it's absorbed better by with a fat, it's, 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 fat. It, it's fat loving, it's fat soluble. And you can just increase your dose until you feel an effect. Um, the FSA recommends that you don't exceed 70 milligrams of CBD a day okay. when you're using it on your own. Mm -hmm. There's not a ton of research why, but it's just a general safety guideline for people, like many things, you know, when it what is in um, self-care use versus what is medical use. However, there's a lot of patients who try CBD for things like chronic pain and it doesn't work. And it's not surprising to me, but it doesn't mean that medical cannabis won't, won't work for them yeah. because sometimes they need that small amount of THC, which is the pain relieving. That's what helps with the pain receptors and helps reset things. Um, so I would say to people, give it a shot. If you want to add it to your self-care arsenal, you can use it alongside a relaxation practice. You can use it in your coffee if you like coffee but you find coffee makes you feel jittery there's all kinds of ways just like yeah. other herbal medicines you can try it yeah yeah um but if you're still wondering if it would work for you if you have a more severe condition it's still we're seeing an expert in this area on a medical level yeah without just binning it completely yeah yeah you mentioned two things i really want to talk about that so <laughs> one is cbd and coffee now my from my very limited understanding of it Coffee, something that raises your cortisol level, might make some people jittery. Uh, obviously, it's a stimulant and yeah. adenosine blocker. You'd think that that might have an, an antith you know, uh, it might be the antithesis of what you'd expect from CBD. So, why would you 
put them two together. Combine what, what, them. Yeah, what, what's the, uh, the evidence around that? There's not a ton, well, there's not any evidence combining it, looking at a really um, okay. research-based model. But when you look at how coffee works in the brain, how caffeine works in the brain, um, the neurostimulant effect it's going to work on different pathways in CBD. So when people talk about, you know, nootropics and having a nootropic stack for uh, mental performance, oftentimes they're using small amounts of caffeine and not that I recommend this, but even small amounts of nicotine to kind of help keep their focus going mm -hmm. and concentration, but you can have side effects from those. Yeah. So when you bring in CBD, uh, it's actually a different mechanism. You're working on, we, we think CBD works on the, hip, um, the hypothalamus, the HPA axis, um, potential on some of the serotonin subreceptors. So it's a different pathway. Um, so it might allow people to, to get, you know, the in the zone kind of focus that they might need in the morning without, without the anxiety. The but ideally you don't want to overuse coffee anyway, yeah, yeah. because <laughs> that is a recipe for adrenal fatigue, which yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of my time is spent weaning people off of coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I also have people who are fine with one coffee a day, like my patients with ADHD, they find that one coffee in the morning is really helpful for them oh, to focus. Okay. Interesting. And then when you add a little bit of cannabinoids, it helps with the anxiety component. Um, so for them, you know, coffee's not always bad. Yeah. Um, it's just in our society, it's really overused because we don't sleep enough. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All these things you talk about on your podcast. Uh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I, like I, I personally have changed my coffee habits massively since I, you know, first started drinking coffee and I'd be drinking at like two or 3 p.m. the last cup and I'm like, yeah. oh no. And then as soon as I, I got about to 12, my sleep, improved when i brought it back before 10 it drastically improved and so i've just had a uh, a coffee today quite late in the day for me but it's just to keep me powered through yeah, basically on yeah. a very special occasion but like generally just keeping it before 10 for me personally has been like game changing i'm exactly the same yeah. <laughs> and so in medical school i'm sure you remember these days yeah, you know, yeah. just it's just downing the coffee because yeah. the hours that you had to you know junior doctor the hours you had to work is just insane yeah, yeah. um but I'm the same. I'm very caffeine sensitive. Yeah. I actually, my morning coffee now, since I've had River, and I started doing this because I was breastfeeding, I was pregnant. Yeah. And then I was like, well, I probably don't need the full calf. So I get really good decaf and I mix it. So um, now I only have a tiny bit of full calf. Gotcha. Yeah, and I only yeah. have a full calf once in a blue moon. Yeah. Um, like, like you said, a special occasion. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it just, it's like rocket fuel. Yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. When I have a real one, I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't have as many, much afternoon energy slumps. Um, yeah, yeah. The sleep fragmentation, because, mm. well, well, you know this, you know, you talk to your patients about caffeine and they say, I get to sleep fine, but it's the fragmentation of the sleep yeah. cycle. Alcohol's a little exactly. bit Exactly, another thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it's the fragmentation that they really need to, to kind of examine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. in fact, I do a coffee fast once a year for yeah. 30 days where I have no coffee and I'll just have like uh, decaffeinated teas or, you know, real whiskey tea or whatever. And my first cup after that fast is incredible. Like I crave that cup. I, I, can, always, I can almost like feel like, you know, what it feels like when I have my first cup and it's, it's great. Yeah. But half caps are like a nice little cheat code actually for when you, you crave sort of, the ritual of having coffee uh, without wanting to deal with the the, the detrimental caffeine effects yes. later on in the day. Anyway, I laugh about coffee. So uh, <laughs> and, uh, back to CB. So uh, the, the self-care regimen um, where people would use a an, an available CBD product, yeah. perhaps from a, a pharmacy or, or a wellness um, uh, store. Often most people go mm. for the well-branded yeah. Uh, CBDs yeah. or the ones that are affiliated <laughs> with like, I don't know, a UFC fighter a, or a yeah, particular sports celebrity. Yeah, person or something or, or celebrity. Exactly. Yeah. What are the things that we should really be asking about and yeah. looking for in a good quality CBD product? So this is actually really important. Unfortunately, there's less full spectrum products on the market now because of some really strict regulation that came in about CBD, which was, you know, a lot of people say it was meant to be protective, but unfortunately some of the small brands that were really good quality, they weren't able to, to pass the 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 um the regulation so there's less choice than there used to be but you still there's still a few companies that have passed that are what's called full spectrum cbd um now how you know they actually are the good ones is they have what's called a coa or certificate of analysis okay that will be on their website mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily the ones that have like you said the celebrity endorsements mm -hmm. um they want to have a coa and you want to know exactly they should say what terpenoids are in it. Um, you know, it's a myrcene-rich extractor. These are the main terpenes. This much CBD, this much CB, 
uh, you know, no THC because they can't have any THC um, or trace amounts of THC. And then they should have the breakdown in that COA that you can look at and they will um, actually say what minor cannabinoids are in there. So when you get a product like that, it's a lot easier to know that you're getting what it says on the tin. Because even in Holland and Barrett, there was a recent um, report that came out that someone just sh- in the industry just shared with me that there's still some things on the shelf that have no CBD in them. Really? Because they haven't been pulled off the shelf yet. Oh my God. Um, That's... And it's well-branded stuff. So, you know, it's um, there, there's lots of good guys out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's lots of questionable products. Yeah, too. definitely. And a COA, is that uh, an independent analysis? Yes, or is it, exactly. Okay, that's okay. a third-party lab gotcha. that's, you know, ISA accredited and so forth that's been tested, gotcha. testing that product. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those are great, great tips. And I think, you know, I'm definitely going to be looking out for that COA <laughs> if, I, if I try CBD at some point in the future. Um, in terms of mental health conditions. We were talking about CBD with a little bit of THC in various sort of proportions, something that you try titrate upwards mm-hmm. as, a, as a safe way of introducing to it. Yeah. What What is going on? <laughs> what, <laughs> what, how How yeah. is this I- I- enacting, you know, the desired effect of, you know, improving someone's, w- w- yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great question. So in, in our clinic, in that, which is now in the UK, we get a lot of referrals for patients who, have basically tried everything. They've tried a few different antidepressants. They've tried CBT, which I still think is fantastic, but um, they might have anxiety and a social component to their anxiety or a panic disorder component, or they might have a mixed anxiety and depression, or they've been diagnosed already with treatment resistant depression. And the medications that they've tried, the mechanisms of action are just not working. Their brain is just not responding. So we have to do something different. And we all have an endocannabinoid system in our, in our brain, in our body. And the endocannabinoid system is actually involved in every single brain area that is involved with emotional regulation, um, involved with stress response, trauma response. So it makes sense that these cannabinoids from the plant, they work on the system we naturally have that can get out of whack in mental health conditions. And we also know that even the, the receptor in the brain that binds to kind of locks on to THC is involved with both anti-anxiety and pro-anxiety behaviors. Okay. That's why at different doses it can do different things. Oh, yeah. And then further we know that mental health conditions, they're not just in our brains. They're not in our they're not, we've gone from it's just in our mind to it's just in the brain. We used to say it's just in your mind. Well it's not, it's in the brain to saying, oh, it's in your brain and your gut and maybe your immune system (laughs) too. So guess where the endocannabinoid system is concentrated? In the brain, in the gut, and in the immune system. So a lot of mental health conditions, there's an element of neuroinflammation. The immune cells in the brain become reactive. And this is probably what the cannabinoids are working a lot on. We still have a long way to go in figuring out the exact mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But what we find clinically is people with treatment resistant anxiety and depression and sleep problems, they respond within sometimes days, but definitely within weeks to medical cannabis. Sometimes you have to change a few times to get the right product, Um, but it's life-changing. Like people with treatment resistant anxiety and depression, um, people who said that they had never slept properly in their life, like 30 years of not sleeping and they try cannabis and within a week, they feel normal in the morning. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, and then we have some patients who have, we've even combined cannabinoids, you know, with, with other treatments like ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, uh, which is a, a novel, like, psychedelic psychotherapy, which works in, a, in even a different way than cannabis. And they can work together. Mm. So it's real hope for, the, for people, my patients, with these conditions that have been, they've been told, they've basically given up. Yeah. They're never going to get better. They're never going to feel better. Yeah. Um, their relationships fall apart, you know, they're not happy and cannabis has given them their life back. It's not a cure-all, but it allows them to start living life again. And then they can do things like therapy and they can go out and exercise and they can socialize, um, rather than just living a very small life that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. I love the way you describe that because you're not trying to insinuate that it's a panacea or yeah. cure-all it's almost like sometimes it can be used as a crutch to get you yeah. towards like more activities that we know are also helpful um you mentioned treatment resistant uh uh 
people uh, who you know have tried a whole bunch of different things prior to getting cannabis. What's your opinion on actually bringing medical cannabis further up the chain uh, and making it yes. more first line? So in Canada, we I have done that, of okay, course. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, it's a more um, conservative prescribing environment. Uh -huh. And of course, I have to follow. It's a very polite way of saying it. Like <laughs> <laughs> Just in case anyone at the GMC is listening to this. <laughs> um, so of course, we, we have to follow you know, what, what a jury of our peers would say is acceptable in uh -huh. where we're prescribing. So here I am more conservative than I was in Canada. But I firmly believe that patients, if you are doing proper informed consent um, and really doing it properly, not just being lip service to it, which is really what we try to do, and they decide they do not want to take an SSRI or they do not want to take that sleeping pill or they don't want to take that gabapentinoid, which has terrible side effects for a lot of people and has higher risk, that's been proven, mm -hmm. and they want to try cannabis first, why should we say no if they've made an informed decision with me mm -hmm. as an expert in this area yeah. to move forward in that manner? So I think it should be a potential consideration far earlier on than it is. Um, and I think that will come because I think patients will start demanding it because on one hand you have, and listen, just because it's natural, it doesn't mean it's no risk. There's risk to everything we yeah, get patients. Yeah. Um, but it's when it's done properly, it's low risk. It's very well tolerated. It's better tolerated than any of the other medications that I use clinically for the same conditions. And it is natural. So, you know, to just pass it over because of a lingering stigma and some unscientific thoughts um, that we have, or, you know, a knee jerk reaction that, cannabis causes psychosis, which is the knee jerk reaction of clinicians without, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, great thinkers. Yeah. Um, so I think, and then they, the, the fallback is always do no harm. And of course we need to do no harm first. That is of course the most important thing, but to just reflexively say that without really thinking about what we're doing, that doesn't serve the patient either. Yeah. And patients are smart. They're, they're really starting to speak up about this more. So yeah. I think it's going to change. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you're restraining uh, yourself because <laughs> I know you're very passionate about the subject, but you don't want to say the wrong thing, which I totally understand. But yeah, no, we, we are definitely more conservative over here. And you, but you've definitely pushed the, the boundaries for medical cannabis in this country and, and have done, uh, obviously, before. Um, in terms of where you were when we first chatted on the podcast, I mean, how how does one find a medical practitioner who is licensed to use medical cannabis? What's the process that one, if one is a clinician and actually wants to start using yeah. it, what's the process behind that? So right now, unfortunately, it's only in the private sector. Okay, I'd love it to be otherwise. And mm -hmm. a lot of my nonprofit work is working to change that, to get this covered in the NHS. And there is a fantastic organization who I work with called Drug Science. Mm -hmm. The researchers are doing the first huge real-world data collection uh, for medical cannabis, trying to change NHS policy about this. So it's happening, but right now it's in the private sector. So in the private sector, there's there's lots of cannabis clinics. Um, my practice is an integrative cannabinoid medicine practice. I don't just throw cannabis at people and walk, let them walk out the door. I don't find that that, just like anything else in isolation, I don't find it works very well. Yeah. Um, but there are many clinics now that operate privately in the UK if there are clinicians who want to to add this to their practice and i think that's the best way for independent clinicians who already have a practice where they're open-minded to start doing this themselves rather than joining a cannabis clinic they can add this to their practice um and for that it's it would be really i think i always you know say it's good to get training so i'm the vice chair of a nonprofit that is physician run physician led where we all volunteer our time called the medical cannabis clinician society you can join us for a small fee a year and you get peer support from myself, from Professor Barnes, from a lot of other colleagues. Um, we started it about three years ago and it's it's grown to over 300 doctors. So we do training, we do education, and we do peer support. Mm -hmm. So for people who want to start adding this to the practice, that is the best way to do it in the UK. And we, yeah, we welcome everybody. <laughs> That's great. And is there like a registration process or something like that? Or um, It's just a membership. Okay, great. So I, I believe and our admin, I'm not the admin person for this, okay, yeah, but I sure. believe we're just, I believe we're just under a hundred pounds a year. So it's, okay. it's oh, yeah. quite affordable. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And then we do CME training. Brilliant. Uh, I set up a listserv with Professor Barnes a few years ago where uh -huh. you type in your clinical question with, without your patient identifying information uh -huh. and you have a slew of cannabinoid medicine experts. We have oh, some brilliant. of my colleagues from overseas now who are on it yeah. and we all give you pure 
support. I love that. All for that's, free. That's amazing. So that's my pitch for the society. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fab. That's fab. I want to hear your pitch for um, uh, the Resilience Medicine Clinic uh, as well. Please tell me about that. That sounds awesome. So that that is the medical clinic that I founded here in the UK. Um, because I wanted to bring the way I was practicing in Canada to the UK, and that includes cannabinoid medicine, but in the larger context of integrative medicine. Um, because like I said, these things work better together. So for example, you know, we see patients and we, we're going to give them a mind-body practice that's really simple and easy to do at home. And they do that with their cannabis, and we're going to give them a food prescription as well, and possibly a few supplements. And you put it all together, and then we help. we have a system to help track how they're doing and they can engage with it too. They can. There's actually an app that's coming out in two weeks time where they can track how they're feeling with all the things that they've done. And they can also add things that they might be doing with another practitioner. Um, so it gives them kind of like a well-being dashboard. Yeah. Um, so they can track their resilience, they can track their mental health, they can track things like their energy levels, their sense of calm, their yeah. sense of mental clarity. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. And that's what I'm doing with my patients, you know, here in the UK. Absolutely. I'm a firm believer yeah. in what doesn't get tracked, doesn't get managed. You yeah. know, you have to track these things and it doesn't have to be, you know, a continuous glucose monitor no. or, you know, invasive lab test or whatever, or stool test every week. No. You know, it can just be a simple check in with yourself. Yes. And training yourself to be a lot more interoceptive. And this is what the app is doing because mm. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really big into real world data in citizen science. Mm. And what I was finding was, you know, we have a lot of this, this evidence emerging that actually when you take patients' subjective feelings, you ask someone how they feel concretely. You say, how is your energy today? How is your mood today? How is your pain level today? But you do it on a big scale. You actually get quite uh, valuable, um, you know, data, valuable data that, you know, is potentially more useful in some cases than an RCT, a randomized placebo control trial, where you're doing something so narrow. Yeah. Tells us a lot about how people are actually doing in a wider context. So for me, that is my approach because patients have to be a part of that process. I want to put the data back in their hands because they want to be partners in this um, rather than just being passive people who are just kind of pulled along a journey um, that they don't feel like they're fully in control of. And especially as in, you know, complex chronic health and mental health. And often those patients feel really marginalized in, in the health care interactions that they've had. Um, they don't feel like they've been listened to and heard and they have such valuable input. They, they often know their body and their mind. Yeah. If they really are, can get in touch with that, that we can use that to, to get them better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. With, with, with the, the specialty that you have with the clinic, mm -hmm. what do you find it, is a, one of the therapies or a collection of the therapies that are having the most sort of value add that we're not really talking about as much in conventional medicine. Obviously, CBD is one, but or medical cannabis, I should say. Um, but what are, the, what are the other ones that are perhaps a little bit more fringe? Yeah. Um, well, as we know, the brain gut connection, things like psychobiotics, which mm. are tailoring what probiotics or what foods you 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 eat to to change the gut microbiome so i think microbiome health is a big area mm -hmm. um i have a lot of patients who have symptoms of what we used to call leaky gut and leaky brain we're trying to be a bit more scientific with as one of the speakers pointed out yeah, today, yeah, yeah, yeah. our colleagues don't take us seriously when we yeah. say things like toxins and leaky gut yeah, and leaky yeah, brain yeah, yeah. but you know there's there's barriers in between our gut and our uh, bloodstream and there's barriers between the brain and the rest of the, the nervous system, the rest of the body. And those barriers can break down for many reasons. So that is an area where when you have neuropsychiatric cluster of symptoms, so you have a patient with fatigue, anxiety, they're tired but wired, they, they have um, inflammation, inflammatory markers that are raised, they have altered glucose metabolism, they have memory problems potentially. I mean, you, this is a really good place to start is the gut. Yeah. Um, and like you said, it doesn't have to be high tech. Sometimes we go high tech when they've already done all the food stuff, but a lot of people starting with the food approaches can go a long way. So that's one area. The other area, area is uh, therapeutic psychedelics for again, treatment resistant depression, uh, complex regional pain syndrome. So right now we have ketamine, which we can work with mm -hmm. legally, um, hopefully soon because of the research that many of our colleagues are doing, some of the speakers here, uh, Imperial College is one of the leading, yeah. leading places for this, um, psilocybin for magic mushrooms, DMT. These are probably coming down the pipeline as a very, very good tool. Again, mm. used in, 
in, in, in the integrated medicine context. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, not in isolation. Be, no. when, when you talk about these things, I just want to point out to the listener, we're, we're not talking about just that and that's it. It's not like the traditional pharmaceutical model of health where you get a pill for every ill. It's very much Correct. in the context of all the other things that you it talk about. It has to be done together because, you know, otherwise, you know, you can just go and have a peak experience yeah, recreationally yeah, with yeah, these yeah. substances. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it was legal in the places where it's legal, that's fine. But that's what it will be. It will be a peak experience yeah. and that's it. If you want to change behavior, if you want to use it as a as a medicine, then it's got to be it's got to be in the right container, the right set and setting, as yes. we say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really the same with cannabis. Yeah. So they really go hand in hand often. Yeah. 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 If you could predict when we're going to have psychedelics uh, uh, prescribable, <laughs> what, what, what timeline are you thinking? Well, we already have ketamine. Uh -huh. um, only in the well, I shouldn't say only in the private sector because um, Dr. Rupert Machine at Oxford, he is he is the leading expert in ketamine. Uh -huh. And he's right here in the UK yeah, and doing yeah. it in the NHS. So that's already happening. Um, when do I think it's psilocybin is going to go from research license? Uh -huh. to, I mean, it's already happened and it's already got breakthrough drug status in the US. Uh -huh. So I would like to say in the next two to three years. Wow. Um, Oh, I, I, I'm an optimistic person. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> well, if there's anything to go by with, the, with your passion around CBD and how much that's moved on, I know it's been slower over here, but I think a lot more people are talking about it. And you're right, the change is going to come from the community of patients that have found incredible benefits from it in the context of everything else that you do. So I think we're going to see some really positive movements in the other fields as well. So thank you so much, Danny. Your wisdom is brilliant. And uh, your next book, we'll have to get you back on the pod to I, talk I'd about the next, that. yeah, the next book when it comes out. But uh, I, I predict big things. <laughs> Thanks, Ruby. It was so lovely, Danny. Yeah. If you if you enjoyed that video, you'll love the library of content that we have on doctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements and lots more. Have a wonderful day.